Welcome to Innovating Leadership, co-creating our future. I'm your host, Maureen Metcalf, the founder and CEO of the Innovative Leadership Institute. I am delighted to be joined today by Ren Washington and Laura Gibson from the Center for Creative Leadership. And the topic is art and its impact on creativity and leadership. Laura, would you give us a brief, who are you? Thank you, Maureen. I received my degree from North Carolina's Appalachian State University and studied art there. I've been with CCL, the Center for Creative Leadership, for over 20 years, spending part of that time in marketing, but I was always involved with the art program we have here. Around 16 years ago, I transitioned to becoming the art curator and have truly found a passion as I represent local artists in our building, as I beautify the campus. And that is for both our employees and for our program participants. Thank you. And Ren, about you, and then we'll learn more about you as we go through the conversation. Sure thing. Hi, Maureen. And hi, Laura. Ren Washington. I'm one of our leadership solutions partners at the Center for Creative Leadership. So I get to design, develop, and deliver our work and am fortunate enough to see the impact of art real time on our participants. So excited to talk more about what we do and how that happens. Cool. Thank you for joining me. And this is the first time we're doing a podcast over our five and a half year history about art and leadership. And it's a topic about which I'm very passionate. Years ago, I helped organize MBA on sites for remote programs. So, years before we all went through COVID. And one of the things we did was visits to art galleries and had students look at the art and use it for creative problem solving and other development options, including learning how to relate to art as an executive, that we need to have the capacity to not only be creative and inspired, but also the social skills of connecting around art. So I am absolutely delighted that CCL is doing this work. How did the idea of showcasing local artists in a professional education setting come about? It was really born of necessity and became a natural fit. Being a nonprofit, when we opened our doors over 50 years ago, there wasn't much of a budget, again, as a nonprofit, to put art on the walls. And that's when the idea of let's invite local artists in and showcase their art. And that's really how it started. Over the years, though, as our program developed and evolved, it really went from a volunteer situation where different people handled different aspects of the program to having an art curator, having three exhibits open to the public every year. And it became a large part of our culture and our identity here on this campus. Ren, anything you want to add in how you're using it now? One of the things that I'm most proud about the center is our commitment to the communities that we serve and the communities that we live in. And the way that not only are we able to bring art into participants' lives when they come through our programs, but to demonstrate, to walk the talk that we use this as a platform to lift the voice of those who may not often be heard. And I think that's, if not clearly stated in our mission, it's part of CCL's DNA. And so that is a powerful message to communicate to everyone around the world as we try to make a positive impact on it. One of the things you mentioned is it's rotating art, not owned art. Can you make the distinction, and I think you've already said it, but I want to maybe elaborate a little more on other than you didn't have the budget to buy it, which I understand. But I think there is also a benefit to featuring local artists and rotating art and continuing to inspire the creativity of seeing something new on the walls. 100%. Just from the reaction I get from employees when it's art change day, new art comes in, it's stacked along the hallways, and employees will take time, come through, and get excited and energized over what's coming. I do too. I say I have four Christmases every year, besides the one in December. Every time artists deliver their work, I'm opening up these new things, and it's really exhilarating for me, but I see that same excitement in our employees as they walk through Several have said they don't have to visit galleries because the gallery comes to them. Having that opportunity to showcase local artists and go through those groups, we have become a place in Greensboro that artists want to be. 
our gallery space is booked into 2024. So people want to be here. Artists are excited. Employees are excited when it changes. And stories I've heard from participants, they don't even know why they're happy about the art sometimes until they make a connection and they get it. Beautiful. Thank you. So, Ren, let's talk about several things come to mind, how you integrate it into the programs, how it creates creativity, and then I want to circle back also and talk about the culture you're creating in the workplace for CCL employees, because it sounds like there are benefits not only for your participants, it's also for the artists in the local community and the employees. So let's start with how do you integrate art into leadership development programs? One of the ways that I think we find connection is a real inventory of our environment. When we do our work with leaders and and helping people be better for the people they work with and the people they go home to, often it starts with an inside out point of view. And two, when we start to go inside out, we start to inventory who we are, why we are, and then we start to look at our internal cultural historical artifacts. And that's what art is. I think art is a collection of our history. It's our cultural artifacts. And when we start to investigate outside of ourselves and look at our organizations, one of the ways, especially in the equity, diversity, and inclusion space, one of the ways that we're trying to investigate the worlds that we are living in is what are the cultural artifacts of the organizations we inhabit? What are the things on the wall? What are the things that we're seeing every time we walk in the building or even behind our little boxes on Zoom screens? You know, a key example I give to people is, do you have an oil painting kind of culture? When we investigate our organizations about that, I mean, is there a hallway somewhere where you have a bunch of oil paintings lining your hall that all look like much the same gentleman who used to run the organizations? Now, Maureen, Dan, I see that awesome art that you have behind me, and I know the cultural things that I have too in mind. That is sort of the tapestry that weaves us together. So, Maureen, I think when we think art and leadership, we want to investigate our surroundings to inform our actions. You know, I think of traditional, quote, corporate art, and it's typically abstract or some non-offensive landscapey thing and doesn't often represent the organization. And as we were talking, I've got a beaded Maasai wife beater, which is a very odd thing to have on my shelf. But one, it represents a trip I did to Africa. It also represents for me the opportunity for women and underrepresented women to find their power. So for me, the art is very important. And then the other is a Pueblo pot that the going inside of the Pueblo is that finding myself. As a representation of exactly what you're talking about, the art's very personal. So even my little tiny workspace absolutely represents what I value. And the reason I'm talking about my own thing is just for leaders to think about the space we're creating for our employees, whether it's the entire organization, Laura, as you're curating, or my individual office when people meet with me. What environment am I invoking and what am I inviting people to participate in? Maureen, I love that because when we think about our personal spaces, one of the things we talk about in our programs when we're wrapping up and we're sending people back is we say the hard work starts when CCL goes home. You know, CCL is an amplifier. We're an augmenter. We help leaders be better. No one comes to us who's broken. So people are already really proficient. We just want to give them more tools. And then we say, here's ways to apply it. And one of the ways that we bring this work to life is making our goals visual and visible. And by putting them in observable places, whether it's an image or something that someone walks into the office and says, hey, what is that thing? Or I look behind you and I say, hey, that looks like a bubble bowl, Marina. You know, I've, I've had something like that. And then all of a sudden we have these moments of connection or, or really shared accountability in the context of what I'm talking about, where if you see something behind me, I said, you know, actually that's a goal that I'm working on. And, and let me tell you a little bit about it. Now, all of a sudden I have this organic accountability and I think art is also an interesting service for organic accountability. You know, Laura, when I look on our walls, I'm reminded of our commitment to our community. I'm reminded of how we're a place where local art can be seen. And I'm reminded of our mission to try to make a difference. 
You know, as you say that, as I look around, the piece in front of me is more of a Buddhist piece and bringing balance. There's a piece in the hallway that's more of a shamanic image. And there's an oil painting. It is the range. But to your point, I have visual cues of the person I aspire to be Mm. and the impact I hope to bring into the world. I realize we used to do that with Covey posters. (laughs) Original art is a in my view, much preferable. (laughs) No cats hanging in there. Maureen, if I can ask you a question, would you say that the art around you creates an emotion within you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the one right in front of me is this Buddhist piece, and it's to calm me because much of my day is not calm. And that's what I think the art that we have here at the center helps our participants as well. They're walking into a brand new situation. They don't know what to expect other than what they've read online. And if they can walk in the door and connect to a certain piece, if they can stand in front of a piece during their week and breathe, if they find something that just gives them a moment to breathe, then they have made that connection. They have found that emotional spot that leaders need to find. Often I think leaders, they think they have to shut down. They have to operate at a certain level at all times. And they need to understand their own emotions. They need to understand the emotions of others. And that's part of what we teach in our programs, that the emotions of others are an important part of your interaction with them. And if we can create that safe space, if we can help make that connection through environment before they even sit down, then we are setting the stage for them to have a productive week and to be open to whatever they're going to hear, whatever they're going to learn. And I think that's part of the impact that the art that we have can really give to the leaders who attend our programs. For me, and I think Ren has pointed to this, assuming I am embodying at this moment the leader, it is who I am, the context I set, and the more calm and centered I can be when I go to CCL and when I go back to my office, then just the idea of mirror neurons and people kind of catch your emotions like they catch your germs when you sneeze on them, that they walk into your office and they can feel your anxiety using art and breath to help us calm and set our intention before every meeting, before everyone either walks in or zooms in. They don't have to be in my physical space. They can still feel if I'm running late, my technology is not working, the stuff that is always the case. My art has a job to do in beautifying, but also interacting. It sounds like I'm giving jobs to inanimate objects, so that could be a bit curious to some people. I'm thinking mindfulness, Maureen and Laura, what you're talking about. And and at CCL, we talk about this idea of burn bright, our solution to burn out. And one of the many levers that we can pull in that is this mindfulness, this presence in the here and now. And art is an amazing vehicle for that kind of presence. I mean, we'll use it often in our experiences or throughout the building or just finding that place of pause and recharge. Critical part of cultivating resilience, maintaining resilience, but also maintaining clarity and What an interesting opportunity to do that. And then think about the positive reverberations when other people recognize that or take just a moment for themselves or pause and think about their environment. It can really mean a lot for what we're going to do next. And Maureen, you asked about the benefits of a rotating exhibit. Because the art changes, we have three exhibits a year. It also can ignite creativity. It's the Center for Creative Leadership. Where would we be if we didn't have creativity surrounding us within the hallways? It's a win-win-win situation for us. It's a win for the local artist who are going to be in front of people from all over the country and all over the world often. It's a win for our employees because their areas get refreshed. Even with the permanent collection that we have accumulated over time as either gift from artists or as purchases, We try to move that around the hallways as well so that things do change within actual workspaces. And the third thing is it's a win for our participants. 
they have these opportunities to see what our local art scene can provide, but also to make these connections with pieces. There was one, I think it was an Instagram post. The person said, I was expecting world-class leadership development. I was not expecting world-class art. And he posted several pictures of the art within the hallways, both of our permanent collection and our rotating collection. And that's just one little tidbit that says, anecdotally, it matters. The environment in which people learn, in which people work, it matters. One of the things that comes to mind is we're right now navigating the tension between work remotely, hybrid, and come back to the office. And some organizations are mandating come back to the office. We're also hearing that those, especially the hybrids now, where I get to be at home and come back part-time, the workspaces are changing dramatically. They're now collective spaces, and I do my independent work at home, it seems like there is a significant opportunity to integrate more thematic art, let me say that, rather than the traditional corporate art. You have a huddle room that focuses on creativity, have bright colors, not necessarily the corporate logo colors. You've got a room that's for deep thinking and reflection. That might be dark blues and calming colors. Having opportunities, again, to put the art to work as part of integrated into the intent of the environment, rather than just something you do as part of interior design in a classical make our office look pretty way. In some cases, it's choosing art that is not offensive versus choosing art that evokes creativity. They're not mutually exclusive necessarily, but I think sometimes the goal of corporate art is to just be as plain and simple and pretty, as you say, versus energizing or thought-provoking, which art can still be It doesn't have to be offensive to be thought-provoking. And we do have to be careful of what we hang because we are, first and foremost, a leadership education facility. We are a business. The gallery space comes secondary, but we want to make sure that gallery space is helping us do our job. It seems like there's a broad range of art from the traditional corporate, which some of it is absolutely beautiful. I'm not trying to at all diminish the value of that work. But if you look at the continuum, there's a lot from fairly abstract to intense colors. And then there's the stuff that clearly you're not going to put in an office because it's naked people and things that aren't appropriate in an office. Mm -hmm. It's nice to inspire conversation, but not that conversation. Yes. What we're talking, I think, about is this idea of the holistic approach to our environments, to leadership. And that's what we talk about at CCL. You know, I think about art and leadership. I think left brain, right brain, and and we're here to synergize. You know, we think creativity and leadership. And when I think right brain, I think rhythm. And there's a rhythm to this work that we do with people. And there's this holistic approach where much like I wish I could see time like a flat circle where all of it's happening at once, I feel like in our art spaces, our environments and our leadership spaces, maybe it's a little less of right or wrong, either or in that real space of what is appropriate here. I think part of, again, what we try to find out for people is not saying This is what it has to look like, but instead create an environment where you can talk to one another about what it should look like. And that is such an interesting conversation when we say what art or what environmental artifacts should represent us. You know, I know I I much prefer modern art than classic art, though I will do some impressionist how magnanimous of me. But that is just demonstrable of how fluid we are in the environments that we inhabit. And so I love art as a conversation and just the beginning of a conversation. What does this all say about us? What do we want this to say about us? Our company is the Innovative Leadership Institute, and much of my art is old African art. There's nothing innovative about a hundred-year-old horn-billed bird from Sanufu, and it represents the foundation of where we've come from. For innovation, we have to have a strong foundation, but one could walk in one of the rooms and see that it just looks like old stuff. 
it creates an opportunity to engage and reflect more deeply because I don't ever remember going to a client's office and talking about the Covey posters. Yeah, no one's really saying and try to investigate that, but there might be more to investigate in the histories and foundations that we lay. I mean, we often talk about in innovating, how can we expect like a minimally viable product? Don't remake the wheel. What an interesting concept. An age old creation, the caveman rolling the stone first wheel, and then we try to innovate, but also maybe not a bridge too far. How do we innovate really quickly? How do we build off of the foundation that we've set? And so I love keeping an eye on the past as we keep an eye on the horizon. Critically important for just our human growth and development to not be doomed to repeat the past. And there is an African piece of art that has a face on the front and a face on the back that is exactly as you're talking about that we have to both look back and look forward at the same time to understand our history and use that to propel us to the future, not in an imbalanced way that I hold to the past, but that in fact it serves a solid future. How else does art inspire program participants? I have a couple of stories that I think illustrate it, not just me projecting how I think our art might impact people, But I have received calls back from participants who attended our programs. And one was several years ago. The person had been through our flagship program, the Leadership Development Program. And in that program, they talk about four facets of life, career, family, community, and self. That's represented in our program as a button with four holes in the middle. That's that touchstone piece that people come back to that are you balancing your life? So I get this phone call and she's attended a program and she said that her career and her family had kind of interrupted her creativity, that she had at one point in her life enjoyed painting. That had to be put aside when career was taking over, when these other things in life were happening. And she went through the program and felt just like they say on the airplane, you get your oxygen before you help someone else. She was running out of oxygen and she got back from the program, went to the store, purchased all new art supplies and started painting again. She was needing to recover her personal joy within her life. To hear back from someone who has attended a program and is putting those things they learned into action and how seeing the art around her made her feel like she knew what she needed to do for herself to be a better person for family, community, and job. That was huge for me to hear that, that again, the environment and what she learned in her program came together to make a difference in her life. And I can't say that that's just one person. You have to kind of multiply that out by the number of people who come who have those same sort of experiences. That was huge. A second this year, a former participant calls, says that she's looking for a particular artist. She saw art on the wall when she attended her program. Could I put her in touch with that artist? Her experience at the center had impacted her career, had made a difference, and she wanted a touchstone to hang behind her in her home office to remind her of her experience and how far she's come and where she wants to go. And I said, that's great. Yes, I can certainly put you in touch with the person. When did you attend the program? And she said, well, it was about 10 years ago. Wow. That showed, again, the lasting impact, not only of a center program, but of her surroundings. I was able to pinpoint that artist from that time, was able to put her in touch. She has commissioned a piece. It's going to hang behind her in her home office. And again, as Ren was saying, it creates this conversation piece behind her, when we pass each other in the halls or when we meet face to face, there are different things that can start a conversation. Rin said, you know, you've got this square of your space that people are looking behind you, looking for something to connect you. That's going to be her piece. You know, I attended a program a few weeks ago and I'm all excited. This was 10 years since she was here And still feeling impact from the program, still having that piece of art gnawing at her that now I want that piece or I want something from that artist here with me. Again, another moment of clarity around environment and the lasting impact of environment and learning. 
those are two specific examples, but I hear that sort of thing a lot when people connect with the art. Thank you. And that connects to Ren's earlier comment about mindfulness as well, that the physical environment in which we create, specifically focusing on the art, really allows us to remember and connect to who we are and what we value and our goals in a way that can really help people integrate and become truly more holistic leaders. So let's shift to creativity. How does working with art and the space help leaders become more creative, especially in an environment where we're solving problems we haven't had to solve before? So our environment is calling forth a new level of thinking that for some people wasn't previously required or even welcomed. Seriously. These are the conversations that we're having all the time, especially on the forefront, again, of our equity, diversity, and inclusion conversations. You know, one of the things that I love about the impact of an exploration of our cultural artifacts is when we can take that out of the classroom, out of the training room, and bring it into the organization. And one of the ways that we do this in in some of our programming is I've sent participants out and said, tell me what are the cultural artifacts of your organization? Start to identify what's hanging on the walls, what's in the marketing material, what messages are being sent, what things are you seeing, especially in this conversation of allyship and performative versus actual. And so often we hear these things around people's commitment to change, but we don't see any change in our environment. And one of the things I love that we do in one of our programs is is that we commission an artist And then we get our participants together to co-create an image. And as we investigate our organization and what cultural artifacts hang on the wall, the plan then is to create this art and hang it on the wall. And so we have now a conversation again that we can say, well, what does that represent? That represents our commitment to diversity and inclusion in this case. And this organization saying that we're more than just a, a say, but we're here to do. I love that as the new forefront of where the rubber can meet the road. We can't take for granted or just pass by this idea that our environments don't matter, the things we inhabit. I think you see it with the pendulum swinging between closed and open offices and how people are still trying to iron out what that looks like. And I think as we return to work in this new future of work, the images that surround us, both from an equity, diversity, and inclusion standpoint, but just also what work means for us is going to be a serious conversation that people are going to have to have. Leaders, if you're listening, you are going to have to navigate what I want from my environment, maybe more now than ever before. How is that impacting how people then behave as they engage in creating that art? I'm trying to take it through, I'm going to be different now that I've done this project. It's interesting, Maureen, it's not so much about the individual saying that I'm going to be different. It's a real effort in saying, organization, what are you going to do now that's different? You know, a lot of the time when we work with underrepresented groups, whether it be women or people of color, they're told, you need to change. There's something wrong with you. Shift your behaviors. And when reality, we understand just empirically, that's not the case. There's nothing less effective about a woman or a person of color than anyone else. And instead, we really need to start investigating the environment. And so what this art project does when we get our participants working with this artist to then commission a piece of art that's going to go on the organization's walls, what we're saying is, hey, organization, now this conversation is not just happening over at the Center for Creative Leadership in a room in Greensboro, but it's happening now in your offices where we need to be discussing these things more intentionally. And then I think it's a really interesting idea how we use those images around our environments and cultures to have those conversations around what are we doing and what should we be doing. My partner, Mike, is on the advisory board for the Columbus Afrocentric School. They had a school tour with the architect And it was interesting, Afrocentric, so helping people of African heritage understand their heritage and integrate and be proud of. So to your point, people of color don't need to change to become white people. We all need to understand one another's heritage and appreciate. And so walking around with the architect, it was fascinating that there were actually columns 
African style of column before Greek and Roman columns. These columns were highlighted in key places in the entryway and in the on the stage, and then one as what would have been something like a smokestack. And then it was tiled with a pattern from, I think, a basket from Zimbabwe, a specific weaving pattern. And there were other patterns in the brickwork around the building. So it was, to your point, the African images were painted in prominent places. The architecture, everything reflected the heritage that was being honored and respected and taught to young people who may not have come from an environment that honored that heritage. Another use of art to help people restore a sense of agency. And nuance. I mean, there are 54 countries in Africa. And so when we talk about this idea of African heritage, there's so much variability in that heritage. I mean, we're having those conversations right now where there is a functional difference between African American and a Black American. And for, regardless of your point of view on that around the world, as you interpret that, there is a realization that if I don't have roots in Africa, then is it appropriate to be called African American? There are plenty of us who have different descent in around the world who, who present that way, who don't all come from those spaces. And so when we start to say, how can we be seen and heard? I really think art is a space for all of us to explore that nuance of what is my heritage? What does it mean for me to be here? And what is our organization saying about the place that we live and work? I love that comment because the architect was a man of the Igbo tribe in Nigeria. He is new to America designing. He is of different upbringing than someone whose family were brought over as enslaved people and presumably very different sense of voice and impact. Absolutely. And Laura, you know, when I think about some of the opportunity that we have to have voice and impact in the art in our walls, I can't help but think about one of our colleagues I just tried to connect you with where she's an artist and she's thinking about ways that she can create art to talk about her own environment, but also then use that as a fund for someone who maybe doesn't have access to those things. And so again, I think just positive reverberation of the world around us, how that can impact what we're doing today and, and so on. Beautiful. Thank you. So let's now shift to how does the art engage in the programs and fundamentally change how leaders see themselves as leaders, how they relate to others, and how they do the tasks associated with leadership? One of the ways that we really see this start to come to life for people is an opportunity for folks to synthesize and manifest visually their growth opportunities, their edges, and really involving other people in their problem solving. And I think, you know, I alluded to a little bit of this earlier. When we think about what's next for leadership and when we think about how we continue to merge creativity into this space for leaders, we encourage them to bring their whole self to being. That that rhythm that I talked about earlier around right brain thinking. And if we can have people say, well, what is a visual representation of the things I'm trying to accomplish? And then have other people actively engage in a conversation and exploration around what that represents and, and a recognition to that as that image evolves, so does my opportunity for growth evolve. That I think we get in a lot of traction with and people are really latching on to. We also use a card set called Visual Explorer that has, I don't know, ran how many, a hundred images? Yeah, loads. That are spread out on a table. And they're anywhere from photographs to classical artwork. And people are asked to pick out the one that explains where they are. It can be used in many different ways. The one exercise I was involved with, you know, where are you right now? And where do you want to be? So looking at those images, you find something that you relate to. And then the unpacking of the why I chose that, that's a part of making that emotional connection for leaders to kind of open up a little bit because, and I think we've said earlier that understanding your emotions and understanding the emotions of people around you that you are leading 
it's an important connection to make. It's not always about the widget that the company makes. It's the people and what their importance is in producing the best widget they can. And leaders have to tap into their own emotional journey sometimes to be able to open up and accept that their way is not always the only way, that other people think differently and you can work with that to make a better widget. It's like the power of metaphor. You know, I'm thinking about Brene Brown, the the Atlas of the Heart, the Odyssey to encapsulate and articulate human emotion. And, And when we think about creativity and leadership, I think what we're starting to see is a more human embrace of the the less structured, less mechanical, you know, what an interesting metaphor, Laura, there of the widget. And I think that's sort of what creativity enables us to do is unlocking the power of leadership through the power of storytelling. We get to go back to the foundations of, of where we are. Like we said, not remaking the wheel and storytelling is magnetic for people because of thousands of years we've used that kind of communication to articulate powerful meaning and messages and and art does that very thing and and I think letting leaders tap into that find themselves again you know I often say in the classroom really successful people rarely need to be told what to do they just need to be reminded and I think there's probably something embedded in us historically culturally in our DNA where we can tap into that creativity and maybe rekindle something that's ancient, but something that will be new and novel because it's been hidden away for so long. So that is just, I think, the power of art and maybe the potential of that creative leadership. Art was on cave walls before there was true language. Undoubtedly. Storytellers came along and they helped preserve history as well. And art was the original story. And I think people look at art and don't even realize why they like something or if they like it or not. And that's where posters in the workplace had its moment in time. I think we're learning more. And heaven knows that for two years that we had to spend with ourselves during a pandemic, we realized how our environment impacted us when we were all in close quarters for a while and how important that environment is to opening up and to figuring out what gives me creativity, what fuels my passion or my energy, whether it's leading a family through a crisis or leading a company through a crisis, you have to find those things that spark you. So I want to go back for a second to the card sort then. Tell me a little bit about how this works, because I've used some of the CCL cards in different environments, I think they're a wonderful tool. So walk us through what the exercise would look like for listeners who may not have had this experience. Yeah, I think one of the things we always keep in mind when we do these opportunities in the programs or experiences is trying to apply them to real world opportunities or challenges. And so usually we'll use this conversation around What's something that you're experiencing at work that's a challenge or or even maybe towards the end of an experience, aspirationally, what might your leadership look like? You know, it's really interesting when I ask a group of scientists to say, okay, I want you to look at a pile of images or a stack of images, and I want you to kind of tap into what you see there as it represents the challenges you're experiencing or, or your aspirational a leadership. And, you know, I have these curmudgeons shaking their heads and saying, well, this is impossible. I don't, my brain, my body doesn't work like that. I'm about zeros and ones. And then people look at these images and then all of a sudden they're connected to, I think, what we've been talking about, that metaphor, that storytelling. And there's this, one of my favorite images is this cave. And on the cave, there's this row of skulls. And I remember I had a participant pick up this thing once. He said, you know, this is exactly like the office. If people mess up, oh, there is hell to pay. And before he knew it, he was able to tap into this image that really conjured up this feeling of what it was to be at work. And so what we do is 
we encourage people to gaze and gather upon the images and pick an image that resonates with whatever prompt we suggest. And and then we have them reflect on that image and share it with the people they're working with. And then we kind of share it at large and we're able to synthesize themes around people's experiences really quickly, whether it's a soaring eagle around the aspirations of our team that we're just going to be rising above the rest or or maybe this congested highway, which is indicative of how hard it is to collaborate with the group. And sometimes uh, there's not enough space to breathe and try our own thing. It's it's amazing when people can see images and ask to say, well, what do you see in that image? How quickly and naturally it comes about. So I'd say that's a glimpse in, into the, some of the experiences of the way that that we've used it or I've used it. And what image you might choose in where you are in your career today doesn't mean that you would choose that image a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. The one I chose was a Renaissance painting, and it was two little girls. They're inside a very small room, and it's just mayhem. Everything is dark. Everything is dirty. But they're laughing. And I had two little kids at the time, and I zoomed right in on that piece thinking, oh, I've got to remember to pay attention to the smiles when everything else is just, you know, all over the place. And now my kids are older and I'm interested just sitting here thinking and talking about it. What image would would I gravitate to? Not that my house is any cleaner or any better, but we're at a different spot in life. And I think it's one of those exercises that people can do throughout their career and see the difference in where they were when they might have done it early on and where they are now or where a team is or where, like Ren was talking about, the aspirations of an organization. Those types of things are interesting in that they can open up an emotional door that people didn't even realize they had in connecting to something at a different point through their career and through their life. I think it's brilliant, the range of images, because if I were choosing the deck, I wouldn't choose one with skulls in a cave. There's a lot of images, Maureen. There's a lot of images. (laughs) And I certainly hope my people don't think that about me. For our listeners who are thinking that would be really cool, but I don't know that I can go to Greensboro to CCL, you sell the card decks, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, in principle, I love the idea of spreading the word. And so they'll forgive me at CCL, but frankly, you can just collect a number of images and have this kind of experience at your fingertips. Now, of course, we've got loads of curated images. So Maureen, I promise you, not all as macabre as a row of skulls. But uh, (laughs) yes, luckily, we've been able to curate it with eyes like Laura's and others to uh, help get some high def quality images that absolutely on ccl.org you can come find. But truthfully, if you've got art at fingertip, you can have this experience. I've seen someone do this with postcards from their travels. You could do it with holiday, although you don't want a bunch of Santa Clauses necessarily. Uh But (laughs) that would lead to a different conversation. But a range of cards they've gotten, although we don't send cards anymore. So this may be a past. Now you have to buy it from CCL because we don't do postcards. I love it, Maureen. You talk, I think about the versatility of that. The conversation around creativity and leadership is as versatile as the art that is in our world. And and it would be amazing. I mean, think about a collection of Santa Claus cards and you, you alluded to, well, that'd be a different kind of conversation. And I can't help but wonder, think about how many kinds of conversations you could use there. Or as we were thinking, I was reflecting on the covers of books that I have or all sorts of imagery in and around the worlds that we have. Exactly, Maureen, like your bookshelf there. I mean, it is endless. The possibilities are endless. And I think it goes back to the power of metaphor, the power of storytelling that intrinsic, natural understanding, Laura, like you were saying, before there was word, there was image. And I think we resonate with those things. And and maybe too, that is the indicator of what we need to tap into for what's next for all of us. And that leads us in, although I have to say, because we're sitting on a screen with a fourth person, our producer, who has probably thousands of CDs behind him. Right. What do those covers look like? And if we were to spread those out on a table, what would we think of? Now, again, the ACDC cover is going to be different than the art in my office, but that's the point, right? Is it's a range of 
of images. Yeah, endless possibilities. Given that you just teed us up for the perfect question, Ren, where do you see art connecting to leadership in the future? Yeah. Leadership and leadership development. You know, for me, it's really twofold. Probably has to, it boils down to maybe what I might call personal manifestation and then what we call um, organizational realization. And I'd say it's it lies on us and within us and then those around us. And I really believe that the new frontier, that terra incognita is actually terra firma. It's the land we've been before. It's tapping into those things that we understand. You know, I'm really big on self-advocacy right now, especially in a lot of work that I do and people in all parts of their career, even in senior parts of their career. I think not enough of us have cultivated the edge about how to promote ourselves and and I think there's a way to do that where we can do it gracefully, humbly, and connect with people emotionally. And one of the ways I do it is through word, but one of the ways that I want to get better at, and I think the real opportunity is through image. What does a vision image or vision statement look like for you? What are those images that say a thousand words that you can put in front of someone that, that can conjure what you're trying to communicate? So I'd say sharpening that saw for people, all of us, is probably that next frontier. And that's that personal manifestation. And then for the organizational realization, there's a lot of shuns in there, but I think really directly impacting the environment around us and intentionally communicating something with the walls that we inhabit, whether it be emailing or sending images to your remote employees. I was just on a call the other day and in support of Pride Month, there was branded materials on their Zoom background that they were able to add in there. And I think that's fantastic. Or maybe a physical mug or when I'm in the office, how can I realize these conversations of this personal manifestation? So we can have real discussions about what does the future of work look like for us and how can we really start to walk the talk by changing the environment around us and not pretending like it doesn't matter. So maybe in the beginning, those things. You know, as you say that, I think of something that either was common a while ago or it was just in my sphere a while ago, the idea of creating a vision board. Because as you said, organizational vision I haven't seen a corporate vision board. One of my clients says the future is bright and they have a picture of something bright, but they don't necessarily then have the images of what does a bright customer experience look like? What does a bright employee experience look like? There isn't visual art to remind us of what we're here for. So that would be an interesting idea to have them engage in the art projects. Yes, it would. We're cooking here, folks. That's free. You're lucky if you've been tuning in. That's loads of value because, <laughs> Maureen, you're absolutely right. I mean, I can already think about what would it look like being in a room of leaders talking about a corporate vision board and just the power of that. I know loads of individuals who use that to unlock their creativity, to cast their vision uh, maybe a little bit broader or to realize it through, mm -hmm. through that visual representation. So I think that is an incredibly interesting idea. And another example, I think, of that, that nexus of art and leadership. Thank you. And Laura, how about you? Frontier. I think the pandemic may have given us a glimpse into how directly our environment affects our perspective and our mindset. And encapsulated like that, you have to kind of multiply it exponentially as to the effect that it has on people as they return to work, as we have to be fluid. Everybody says, um, you know, the new normal, and there has been no new normal. It's been a fluid normal because it continues to change. And we have to embrace that idea that our perspective and our mindset has to be flexible. And our environment, if you're just looking at blank walls, that doesn't open your mind or your emotions to look for the next thing. The center was founded on the idea that leaders are what make the difference in an organization. H. Smith Richardson looked for the cross-country thinkers was the term that he used. People who are looking at the world from a different perspective. And if all you have around you are just blank walls, then your perspective just 
slams right into it instead of having images that give you a door to walk through or a window to look out of to see things differently. So I feel like embracing that change that the pandemic kind of forced us into, as long as we don't forget, humans are really good about saying, oh, that was hard. Woo, glad that's over. And not taking those experiences and keep moving forward with them. And that's what I think the future is within our control as to whether we do say, well, that's then, what's now? When it taught us to pivot, when it taught us to think about things differently, think about work differently, think about careers differently, think about family differently. If we can tap into that, tap into those emotions, tap into the energy and the synergy that comes from our surroundings, however we create them, then we are open to new ideas. We're open to new frontiers that we can continue to work towards and not always look behind, but continue to move forward. Beautiful. Thank you. So I love closing on the the idea that we are creating the new frontiers that happen in our world, not that they are created externally, but that we're actually looking through those doors and windows, imagining what's possible and bringing it into creation. On that note, thank you both Laura and Ren and CCL for this fabulous podcast. Any closing comments? Where would listeners find the cards again? Where would they find the two of you? Absolutely. Well, you can find anything and all things CCL at ccl.org. Pretty simple there uh, on all major socials. Uh, I have no social footprint, so you're never going to find me, but you can find me on LinkedIn. And uh, if you want to reach out there, you can always connect with us. And Laura, I'm sure you've got some great details about anything more specific to the art that we curate or rather that you curate. You can look through to our Greensboro facility through ccl.org and get connected with me. Organizations who are interested in starting a program like this, we've had lots of years of experience, have learned good and bad ways to try to process this information. But I think that viewers, when they're looking at art, I hope they find out that they're getting something from it that they didn't realize that they wanted or in some cases that they needed. And we'll look at an image a little bit differently, knowing that it impacts them one way or another. Thank you. And to our listeners, hopefully you are listening while you are looking at a beautiful image in your house or in your workplace or wherever you are, if you're outside mowing your lawn, that you're looking at a beautiful lawn. Continue to listen, join us again, like and share the content. And if you want to use something like the curated cards to Ren's point, you can either curate your own collection and then let him know, yeah. or <laughs> you, you can purchase a set through CCL. And if you are interested in doing something like Laura's doing with a curated exhibit or rotating exhibits, local artists are almost always looking for additional places to show their art and supporting our local art community is foundational to creating healthy communities. We didn't talk about the importance of art and artists in any community. And we certainly see huge value in the contribution our local artists make, and they are often underpaid because they're living on their art sales. And especially during a pandemic, this means folks are working from a deficit. So support your local art community and support your local podcasters. Like us, share us. 100, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Laura. Be well, everybody.